Welcome to the Disrupting Obesity Podcast. I'm Charlotte Skeins, and I'll be sharing ways to regain control over your body and lose an extreme amount of weight naturally. Being fat is about so much more than just the food. It's about your relationship with food. That means that dealing with your weight is about more than just the food too. You have to change that relationship. You have to start disrupting obesity. Welcome to Ask Whatever number 16 for episode 61, which wasn't intentional and that makes it really fun for me because I love those happy little coincidences. I also love these episodes as much as my flamingos do and your questions keep getting better. So I need to keep getting better at answering as many as I can. We've got a fair few rapid fire ones today and we might as well just dive right in. Do you walk normally or do you power walk? I walk normally. I'm physically in a place where I could maybe power walk for a little bit. I mean, I feel like I'm moving at a, at a pretty decent pace. Uh, I'm not super slow. I have been. Uh, I've used walkers in the past and I've moved slower than molasses in the springtime, but I prefer to walk with purpose now. I don't like to saunter. Um, I just want to get where I'm going, but not like formal power walking at all. Movement is movement. I don't walk for my weight. I walk to get stronger and to try to build some cardiovascular strength too. I don't even think I've done... I don't think I've done one of my, you don't have to exercise to lose weight rants in a while, but you don't have to exercise to lose weight at all. And I've heard it all, Gladys. Come at me from whichever angle you would like. I've heard it. I don't care. Yeah, exercise is great. But if someone can't or won't do it, what now? What's going to happen now? If exercise is a key component of weight loss, which it most definitely isn't, do we just give up? on the person who can't or won't do it that way. So first off, again, you don't need to exercise to lose weight. So why are we discouraging anyone from getting their weight under control using just food, since really that's the only way you have to do it anyway? What, we're discouraging and disenfranchising them because they won't do it your way? Somebody somewhere decided that diet and exercise are ideal. So everybody else just gets shit on and shamed. Where's their hope? Do it my way or you don't deserve good health. You don't deserve to get your life under control. That's some holier than thou shit, Gladys. And I want to be clear. Again, I've never discouraged anybody from exercising. What I am doing is enabling and empowering people by meeting them where they are and letting them in on the big myth. That's it. I don't give a shit if you exercise. I just want the people who've been told their whole lives that there's only one way to do this, that there is another way. There is hope. It's actually a whole lot more doable than you've always been told it is. Everybody deserves good health, whether they're willing to exercise or not. Did you do intermittent fasting from the beginning? Yes, I did. I got my eating window figured out way before I figured out the calorie piece. So I've been a night eater my entire adult life. Basically, as soon as I could control when I ate, I started eating at night a whole lot more. Um, But I've always not been a breakfast person. It was a battle when I was a kid. I mean, I love breakfast foods. I just don't really like eating them when I get up. I also figured out pretty quickly that my hunger doesn't wake up until I eat. Once I eat, food is pretty much all I can think about. But if I hold off, I don't really think about it. With intermittent fasting, it's like with calories. You want to make it sustainable, so you want to do it incrementally. The first thing that you need to do is figure out what your eating window looks like now. How many hours a day are you eating? How many hours a day are you not eating? My typical window when I was losing weight was 16, eight. So I spent 16 hours a day not eating and I had eight hours a day during which I could eat. You don't wanna start there though. Figure out your two numbers, fasting on the left, eating on the right and start by just shaving a half hour off each end or an hour off whichever end you're less attached to the morning or the night. Next week, shave an hour off each end or two hours off whichever end you're less attached to. You see where I'm going with this. You can shrink one end by 15 minutes a pop for all I care. Just rinse and repeat until the number on the left is bigger than the number on the right and keep going until it stops feeling good. That's kind of how you find your ideal window. And once you're maintaining, you can be more flexible with it. I have days that are 16, eight, some that are 18, six. I have some that are 24. It's really all about the calorie deficit. Intermittent fasting works when it puts people into a deficit. Are you going to do an all Gladys episode? So I think this is a fun idea, but I'm not sure though. I do have a lot of fun with the good for you Gladys questions of the week, and it's not like there's a shortage of them. 
but I'm going to need to really think about it. Um, it feels like I would maybe be feeding into negativity and I really don't like doing that. Like I don't end any of these ask whatever episodes with a GFY Gladys because I don't want her or her negativity to get the last word. But at the same time, the only reason I started doing the good for you segments was because even though they can be pretty nasty, um, there's still a lot to be learned there. So I use them as jumping off points to talk about other things that are bothering me or those specific things that the Gladys is upset about too, because that's the thing, right? The Gladys's are all reacting and responding to something I've said or done. So when I set one of them off, it's like I'm being handed a second opportunity to talk about the thing that I was talking about the first time. And they usually give me some pretty decent stuff to work with. So maybe, how do I get out of a calorie deficit and not gain it back? slowly, incrementally. It'll be easier if you lost your weight that way, but regardless, you want to start adding calories back a little bit at a time. This is pretty much the reverse of the advice I give when somebody's starting out. To get into a calorie deficit, you take where you're at and you start subtracting calories until you hit your TDEE minus 500. When you're heading out of a deficit and into maintenance mode, you want to start where you're at and add calories until you hit your TDEE. So let's say that you're currently eating 1500 calories a day in a deficit. We'll keep the numbers really simple. So your TDEE, your total daily energy expenditure is 2000. That's how many calories your body needs each day just to maintain your weight. I'd go back up by 150 calories the first week, 150 the second week and 200 the third. That's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. That's the concrete part, how you get out of the deficit. Abstractly, there's a lot going on mindset-wise when you switch to maintenance mode. That's the not gaining it back part. And it's a reason that you might want to go even slower. The more weight you lost, the slower you're going to want to go to bring those calories back in. There's nothing wrong with adding the calories back like 100 a week or even 75. Just do what you feel comfortable with and give yourself the time that you need. There's, there's absolutely no need to hurry with this. I have spent just an incredible amount of time thinking about the not gaining it back part. It's the not gaining it back part, that 85% recidivism rate that keeps me awake at night. 85% um, gain it back within five years. On average, they gain 25% more than what they had originally lost. I gained weight back and I thought I was in the clear, right? I kept my weight off 201 pounds of it for almost 10 years. And I didn't, I didn't put mine plus 25% back on. I put about 115 pounds back on, but still, and taking it off wasn't exactly a treat. When I set out to create my weight loss experience, um, when I started writing the program, I needed it to deal with the maintenance problem because it seems to me like it's almost just as big of a problem as the obesity crisis is itself. In some ways, I think the 85% thing presents a bigger problem because you can only lose the weight so many times before you give up completely, right? The problem isn't the weight. It's the underlying relationship with food, which is what the whole program addresses. Um, but it's 53 weeks long and a full 12 of those weeks are spent dealing with what I call what now. What do you do now that you've got the weight off, right? There's more than 200 pages of the over 800 page summary workbook that accompanies the program belongs to what now? Um, what do you do once you know what to do and you're losing your weight consistently? Uh, how do you get across the finish line? And then what do you do to make sure that you stay there? So it's very hard for me to answer that question. Um, what do I do so I don't gain the weight back concisely? Um, well, I guess I can. The most concrete answer is to make sure that you change your overall relationship with food while you're losing your weight. That way you won't have the same habits, behaviors, and patterns that got you obese. Make your changes incrementally. Don't beat yourself up. Keep listening and keep sending me questions that are as specific or as general as you'd like. And I'll answer them in real time for you before it makes its way over here for a deeper dive. Speaking of super specific, can you make these with blueberries? So I know that's really out of context, and I also know that it's a total change of pace and definitely not my usual type of question, but it came in about my carrot muffins that are over on Instagram. They were up a while ago. Um, I'm including my answer here because I think it's important to talk about how easy it can be to make substitutions in any recipe, not just mine. I specifically design mine so that you can just pop out the raisins and pop in some cranberries or dried cherries or marshmallows for that matter, whatever you want, really. 
you just, you need whatever you're swapping out to serve the same function. Like you can't substitute flour with chickpeas. It's, it's just not going to work. You can swap out flour for a flour, but you can't use carrots or something, right? Instead, and still hope that your cake will be a cake, let alone that it'll rise. My brownie hack works because I'm swapping a liquid for a liquid. I take out the oil, all thousand calories of it, and I use like a hundred calories of Greek yogurt instead. The same amount goes in. If it's a cup of oil, I use a cup of yogurt. The main thing is the function. The oil's job in the brownies is to help keep them moist. So if I'm going to take out the oil, I need to put in the exact same amount of something else that will do the same job. Greek yogurt, applesauce, pureed sweet potato. There are a whack of things that you could use instead here. And which one you use is going to depend on the recipe. I won't substitute Greek yogurt for oil in my carrot muffins because it's too tangy and creamy, and that's not what my carrot muffins are about. It's great in the brownies, though, because the high cocoa content masks the tanginess. My thing is making alternatives to higher calorie foods and finding ways to make the higher calorie stuff lower in calories. So I'm not going to be swapping things like almonds or marshmallows in for raisins. Not usually, but you can. You can break any recipe down into its composite parts and figure out the calories. That means that you can pull something out, subtract its calories, and add in the calories from the new ingredient. Now, there's way more on this uh, in my cookbook. I don't want to bore anybody that the podcast isn't about recipes. Um, but I also post the individual calorie count for every ingredient so that swapping is faster and easier. But... I think it's important to show you how to do it for yourself. I wanted more than just recipes, right? So I included essays on things like building out recipes and making swaps and substitutions just so it's so that, you know, it's easier and you're coming away with something more than just a recipe in your hand. What are your thoughts about the stop sugar cravings natural spray? Do you think it's a tool to add to your daily routine? So um, my thoughts are that it's snake oil. And the only reason to add it to your daily routine would be if the fireplace is already full of the cash that you'll need to burn this day. Uh, it's all garbage. All of it. This stuff is predatory. Um, all the fat burners and the fat absorbers. It's preying on people who are looking for some help with one of the hardest things there is to take on. Losing a lot of weight is really intimidating and these companies know it. They're very aware of how many people try and fail to get their weight off. They count on it. It's how they keep making their money. Is it best to be 500 calories under or is it more effective to be 750 under? Now, that's going to depend on what you mean by effective. You'll lose weight faster with a 750 calorie a day deficit, but you're far less likely to be able to sustain it and you'll probably give up in one way or another, which isn't really effective at all. 500 is more effective because you need to be able to keep going. I know how tempting faster sounds, but I can think of at least a few examples just off the top of my head where faster doesn't always equal better, and weight loss is definitely one of them. I'm exercising daily, but when I'm using the online TDEE calculator, should I say no exercise to get my true TDEE? So because you're exercising every day, your true TDEE is the one where you include exercise when you're using the calculator. Your TDEE, your total daily energy expenditure, is the number of calories your body burns each day. Not just exercising, but doing all the other stuff that your body does too. Breathing, pumping blood, digesting food, all that stuff takes calories. Then you've got the calories that your body burns with movement too, right? The online calculator is doing a great big mathematical formula behind the scenes when you enter your height and age and weight and your activity level. It's making the best educated guess it can about how many calories your body needs each day. If you tell it you're sedentary when the truth is that you're walking every day, it's not going to give you enough calories. And sure, you'll lose weight faster if your deficit is larger, but you're also way more likely to burn out and give up. Just like a couple questions ago when we were talking about the 500 calorie deficit versus the 750 calorie deficit. And since burning out and giving up is probably the exact opposite of what you want to happen, you're probably not going to want to go that route and you're going to want to be as accurate as you can when you're using the online calculators. You're not doing yourself any favors in the long run if you lie at the outset. The other side of the coin is that it's a bad idea to tell it that you're more active than you are because then it will give you more calories than your body needs and you'll lose weight slower 
if at all, um, because you're not in the deficit that your body actually needs you to be in to lose weight. So when I started at 330 pounds, my sedentary TDEE was just under 2,700 calories. Light exercise was 3,100. Moderate exercise was 3,500. Heavy exercise was 3,900. That is a huge spread. The gap between 2,700 and 3,900 yeah. If I'd lied to the calculator and told it I was doing moderate exercise when really I was sedentary, I would have been eating 3000 calories a day instead of 2200. And I would have been gaining weight because I would have been eating 300 calories more than I needed to maintain my weight every day. Now, for the record, I was moderately active when I was at my heaviest. I was a waitress and there's not a lot of sitting in that job. But I also had a sedentary job and I didn't understand enough about the way calories worked to balance things out on the days that I wasn't at the restaurant. I feel like it's been a minute or two since I answered a version of this one. So how often do you recommend weighing yourself? Daily, weekly, or something else? Weekly. Weekly is the way to go. Anything more and you'll make yourself crazy because your weight is going to be up and down like a fiddler's elbow and anything less and you'll just, you don't have the awareness that you need to keep yourself in check. I keep track of all the questions that come in, even the repeaters. But something I hear most often from you guys is that you started at the beginning of the podcast and worked your way through them, which I think is awesome, by the way. Thank you very much. But I don't want to be boring um, and I don't want to start being too repetitive. So when I do answer a question again, I try to bring something new to the table. We're actually going to do that again in a couple minutes here. Um this isn't so easy for me to do with this particular question because this one's almost a yes or a no for me. I have very different feelings about how often you might need to weigh yourself once you're in maintenance mode. That depends on how maintaining your weight is going for you. The short answer is the worse it's going, the more often you should probably be weighing yourself. Um, but no one should ever be getting on the scale more than once a day. When you're losing weight, I believe it should be no more than once a week. Can you please merchandise bacon and bubblegum? It cracks me up every time you say it. So it really delights me when you guys pick up on my little favorites. It's like when some of you picked up on uh, the switch that I made really early, like more than 20 episodes ago. I Gladys was originally Gwendolyn. Um, and I liked Gwendolyn a lot because it's fun to say, but I also have a tendency to shorten things. And I didn't want anybody to think I'm digging at a certain famous person who shares the same short form of that name, mostly because I'm definitely not. Um, and that would have muddied the waters in ways that I just don't care for. So Gwendolyn had to go and I had to find something else. And as I was going through a list of names that are considered extinct, because um, look at all the poor Karens out there, right? Like it's a fine name, but it has taken on some connotations and that happens with names, right? They evolve. My name was pretty much extinct for most of my life. I've gone from having a name that wasn't even in the top thousand when my parents gave it to me to having a name that I'm pretty sure was number three last year. It's, it's freaky. I spent 37 years basically knowing that if someone called out Charlotte, they were talking to me and now it could be anybody. My oldest boy's first swim class had three Charlottes in it. Um, but yeah, so I was looking at a list of names and I saw Gladys and I just popped it onto my short list of contenders and I had it down to a couple. And then I remembered something that sealed the deal. Um, you can't have a happy bottom brigade without a Gladys. And I'm totally hung up on getting people to call a gaggle of Gladys's the happy bottom brigade. Um, cause it's just as much fun to say as Gwendolyn, but for way more reasons. So I really like it when you guys are delighted by the little things that give me the most joy, like all the bacon and uh, bubblegum diet thing. Uh, that came about because I was trying to think of the most infuriating diet that I could come up with. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of alliteration, clearly. I'm also a big fan of both of those things. I've gone through periods where I eat bacon every single day for weeks. And I used to love gum until I understood that it makes you hungry because of the whole salivation thing. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to find a way to basically make the Gladys's the most upset with me and the bacon and bubblegum diet really seemed to do it. So I think it would be a scream to have bacon and bubblegum merch for sure. Um, and every person who subscribes to my YouTube channel brings me one step closer to being able to do that. So thank you. You say we don't have to exercise to lose weight, but then you say your hero is Richard Simmons. Hypocrite much? Hi, Gladys. Nice to see you. Uh, I hope you're sitting down. Here's the thing. You can disagree with someone and still admire them tremendously. 
And thank you for coming for me and not Richard Simmons, because I can't handle that. Um, but yes, Richard believes in diet and exercise. He has helped millions of people to change their lives by helping them get moving and giving them hope. So call me a hypocrite all day. That's fine. Uh, just please leave Richard out of it. And if loving him and believing in the work that he's doing, the hope and the joy that he spreads, if that makes me a hypocrite, that's fine. Things can coexist without being in complete alignment. I really don't think it makes me one. I, I just don't see it that way. I think you can love and admire someone without agreeing with them, you know, all of the time. I've been with my husband for like 27 years and I definitely don't agree with him all the time, but we're not filing for divorce anytime soon. Someday I'm going to talk to Mr. Simmons about this. And it, it does kind of worry me because I am afraid that he wouldn't like what I'm doing, but I also suspect that with the level of compassion that he has demonstrated and modeled time and again, he already knows that there are people who can't or won't start sweating to the oldies. And I believe with my whole heart that Richard Simmons would never give up on those people or turn them aside. The Richard Simmons I believe in seems to really believe in people. He seems really invested in kindness and spreading hope. And I just hope that he'll see that's what I'm trying to do too. I'm always hungry an hour before dinner, craving carbs, sugar, etc. What can I eliminate or do to satisfy those cravings? So I wouldn't eliminate anything. Uh, that'll probably make things worse. Elimination and heavy restriction aren't sustainable. And whatever you're doing has to be something that you can keep doing. Sure, it, all, it also needs to be something that helps you keep going, right? That helps you to stay in the headspace that you need to be in. I really don't think eliminating things to deal with cravings is helpful in the long run. So let's talk about things that you can do. The first option it's not necessarily the easiest option, but the first one that comes to mind is for you to move your dinner up. Or you could hold off on lunch for a bit so that those two meals are closer together. It, those are options, but they're not always the most viable. So let's say that you can't move your lunch or your dinner. Cool. What then? A high volume, low calorie mid-afternoon snack might be helpful. Uh, my favorite option to deal with cravings an hour before dinner is to eat something. Eat what you're craving. There's nothing wrong with carbs and they can or sugar um, and they can be very satisfying. Track your calories and make sure you stay within them. You can eat whatever you want, whenever you want. Calories can't tell time. The only way to lose weight is to be in a calorie deficit. And the really good news there is that so long as you're in a calorie deficit, you don't have to worry about things like what time it is or what kind of food you're eating. You can lose weight eating nothing but bacon and bubble gum so long as you're in a deficit. Do you ever feel like you just can't stop eating? Not even hungry, just wanting to eat because it tastes good and because you feel the pressure to finish your meal? Yes, absolutely. I felt this way all the time. But I want to break this one down because there are a couple of things going on in there. I always felt like I had to finish my meal, like I had to clear my plate. I grew up in a clear your plate household um, but with a weird sub clause. If you took seconds, you had to eat them. You take it, you eat it which is great for food waste, but it's not so great for my subconscious relationship with food. And this isn't a blame thing. This isn't me laying my issues with food at my parents' feet. Some of them, sure. But it's the way I've handled them that have led to most of my issues and to the solutions that I've come up with. It took me a very long time to let go of finishing my plate, um, of connecting how much I ate to my own feelings of self-worth and the narrative I had that I would hurt other people's feelings or be disrespectful somehow if I didn't eat everything that was put in front of me. The other thing going on with this one is the eating because it tastes good. And the answer there is yes, absolutely yes. I used to overeat all the time just because I was enjoying something. I learned to slow down incrementally. I made small changes so that I could keep feeling like I was indulging myself. But this one isn't about the solution. Um, th th we have a whole podcast for that. Sometimes I think the questions that come in, it, it's just about not being alone with the things that you're going through and knowing that other people have made the same choices and had the same feelings, right? I've got other stuff for solutions. I'd like to help as much as I can. Um, Sometimes I just want you to know that you're not alone. Um, but I have, I have found ways to make things easier and to help streamline weight loss for you. 
I don't have any serums or elixirs, but I do have a weight loss workbook called Disruptor that's available on Amazon. And you can get a free copy of my guide to getting started for the last time through the link in the notes. Uh, and if you're looking for more, there's the program. That's my 53 week long immersive weight loss experience. I want to help you change more than just your weight. I want to help you change your relationship with food. Thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss anything. And it gets us closer to sweatshirts. Keep trying. Keep tracking. Don't be intimidated and don't give up. You've totally got this. Thank you for listening to Disrupting Obesity with Charlotte Skeynes. If you know it's time to take back control, lose the weight and keep it off, reach out to me privately with a direct message on Instagram that says ready so you can start disrupting obesity.